Hello and welcome to Worlds Apart. It's a plot that seems unrealistic even by Hollywood standards. Russia and the United States, they get so frustrated with each other that their diplomatic communication is cut to a bare minimum until one famous actor makes a couple of calls here and there and sets everything in motion. Well, Steven Seagal played that role in real life and he joins us now on Worlds Apart. Mr. Seagal, thank you very much for your time. Now, one of the first guests on the show was um, Dana Rohrabacher, a senator from California uh, who came to Moscow in June and he was investigating uh, suspects, looking for information about suspects in the Boston Marathon bombing. But he told me back then that that trip wouldn't have been possible without your participation. How did you become such an unlikely cultural ambassador for the two countries? <clears throat> I think that Dana and I have been friends for a long time and uh, he knew of my relationship with Russia for a long, long time. Uh, he knows that I go back in Russia a long time and that I have a lot of friends here, some of whom are very powerful and influential. But he also believes that I have insight into the culture, the heart of Russia, and the people who are running the country in some ways. That's his opinion anyway. We were both concerned about not only the Boston bombings, but anti-terrorism or terrorism in general. And um, he asked me if uh, I had any opinions on this. And I said, well, I believe that really uh, Fezbe, and Spetsnaz uh, are some of the world's leading experts on, on, on terrorism. And I believe that uh, there's a reason for that. And it's because, you know, from, from before Beslan, through Beslan up until now, Russia has had to deal with some of the most horrific acts of terrorism in the history of mankind. But what do you think it really says about the nature of relationship between these two countries, the world's greatest powers with some of the largest talks of nuclear weapons when even basic communication uh, wasn't possible without uh, participation of somebody like you who is not involved in politics, you are not part of the government. I think that what happened here is Dana said to me, the last time I asked the CIA to provide me with people and answers, they gave me people and answers that answered my questions the way they wanted it to be answered, meaning the CIA. And the same with the State Department. Dana knew that I knew the right people in Russia, and he knew that I would get them to tell him the truth. And we all feel, Dana and I feel, that Russia and America have never fought each other in a war. We believe that Russia and America should be best friends. And we believe that many of the people in America love Vladimir Putin, we believe that many other people in America love Russia. We believe that many other people in America are not going along with the hocus pocus of certain governmental bodies who want to try to perpetuate the Cold War. We believe that the Cold War is a fantasy and a hoax to perpetuate maybe some sort of financial gain uh, here and there for certain individuals. And we think that the only way to really create world balance and world power and, and, and peace in the world is if America and Russia become brothers and best friends. And that's my mission in life, is to get better relationships between Russia and America and keep them good. Now, you mentioned that you have uh, quite a few powerful friends in Russia, and you also mentioned Vladimir Putin's name already. It's not a secret that you know each other personally. Um, how well do you know each other? Gosh, I, I, I want to be polite and say that I probably don't know him very well. I, I would like to think that I know him well. Um, but suffice it to say that I know him well enough to know that he is one of the greatest world leaders, if not the greatest world leader alive today. He cares more about Russia than anybody I know. And he's not afraid to stand up and do what needs to get done. Interesting. Now, the two of you share an affinity for martial arts. He has a black belt in judo. You have a seventh dan black belt in Aikido. Does it mean that you would have a similar life philosophy? I mean, I'm not really sure whether or not him and I agree on everything. I'm sure we don't. I know that he has studied Eastern philosophies. Uh, the first time I went to his home, I 
walked in and saw a life-size statue of Kano Jigoro, uh, who is the founder of Judo. So I was immediately, you know, taken and impressed and, you know, sort of really uh, wanting to get to know this man deeper and deeper. Um, he, he is a student of uh, Asian philosophy, but he's also a student of, you know, medieval, you know, great leaders and great tacticians. He's, he's a smart man who studies those people who have had amazing results in history. Now, I used to cover Kremlin politics, and I remember President Putin making a lot of references to judo to explain his political uh, strategy, his political views. And when you look at his very long presence in the Russian politics, it, it indeed looks like a series of judo matches because he he's very uh, patient, he has perseverance, he studies his opponents carefully, he waits out for the right moment. Uh, what do you think about this political strategy? Because some people feel that it's way too calculated. Well, first of all, the main goal in life is to win. And uh, it is good to be calculating, it is good to be patient, it is good to be able to wait for the right timing because timing is everything. Um, I was raised in Asia, I was raised studying tactics, and I think that this makes him the great politician he is. I think in this recent debacle where, you know, President of the United States, you know, wanted to bomb Syria, I, I think the whole world saw who was the senior statesman, more diplomatic, uh, more intelligent and, and, and more caring about, you know, uh, the human dilemma. But um, as commendable as that may be, it also sometimes used against your own country, especially now when uh, the United States and Russia have a somewhat tensuous relationship. Some people at home may call you unpatriotic for saying something like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I, I love America. I'm not unpatriotic in any way, shape or form. There are regimes, you know, I may have loved Reagan, I may have loved Kennedy, I may have loved many of the presidents, but right now the regime that we have, uh, uh, myself, Congressman Rohrabacher, many of the Republican Party, we don't agree with a lot of things that, that President Obama is doing. I didn't agree with bombing Syria, and that's all I'm saying. You got a lot of sneering and negative press for your engagements here in Russia, especially for your public appearances with Putin, even though they weren't explicitly political, you were just supporting sports and trying to engage young people in martial arts. But why do you think Western press is so critical of um, the ties between the two of you? Because you have to understand whether or not it is intelligent or ethical or moral, one of the great techniques of even Adolf Hitler, uh, and he talked about his propaganda masters, and there's that uh, you know, age-old adage of tell a lie enough times and it becomes the truth. One of the things that you know, uh, certain people's regime has become very adept at is controlling the press and controlling the media and controlling, for example, I'll, I'll say it right here, CNN. Do I think CNN is, you know, completely telling it like it is? No. I think they have an agenda. I think their agenda is, is bought and paid for. That's what I think. And so, you know, I'm seeing CNN constantly slamming Putin, and in some ways th th they, they don't even say not only the facts, but they come out and say complete lies. And I will stand up to their face and say that. And, and so this isn't about who's telling the truth, who's right or who's wrong. It's about a smear campaign and who can manipulate uh, uh, the, the press. Now, I, I think you took uh, even more heat for uh, your public appearances with another Russian leader, and that is Ramzan Kadyrov, the president of Chechnya. And he's, of course, a controversial figure, not just in the West, but also here in Russia. What do you see in him? Okay, I have said this over and over and over and over and over again. If he gets indicted, if somebody makes, you know, legal and official charges against them, I want to know about it right away. Every single president I know, and I know many, there are rumors about all of them. Every single one of them, including Obama. There are criminal, you know, uh, allegations against him. You know, criminal. Uh, the, the, there are many allegations against many of the different presidents. Hey, uh, is Ramzan Kadyrov a war criminal? Is he really? If he is, show me something that rises above wild conjecture and speculation. 
Okay? Show me something that, that, that is proof that he really committed war crimes or did anything that, that, you know, is criminal. When I got together with Congress in an official congressional delegation, we talked about Ramzan. We talked about Chechnya. And I said, guys, give me what you have. Some of the stuff that they said, they, they, before they would even tell it to me, they said, it is wild. It is crazy. It is, and, and when I heard it, it was even wilder and crazier. I mean... Uh, do I believe any of that? No. Did Congress believe it? No. Now, uh, when you mention Chechnya to average Americans, uh, they immediately think of war, destruction, probably human rights abuses. Uh, and you've been there in Chechnya. I'm sure you had some preconceptions before your visit. What struck you about that region of Russia? I mean, the way I looked at it was that there may have been a time where Ramzan was fighting against Russia, I'm told there was. Is that true? Absolutely, yeah, okay. there was. And he was fighting for what he considered to be his country and his people. But there came a point where the war was over, where Ramzan and Vladimir Putin got together and made an agreement. My understanding was that at that point, Ramzan said, any terrorists in my country will either leave or be killed, and I and my people will be the first to kill them because we do not believe in terrorism. We do not believe in anything like that anymore. So keeping that in mind, you know, we have to understand that life changes in, as regimes change, even in America and even in big, you know, first world, you know, countries, life, politics, the way people think, the way people do things completely change. I thought that Ramzan was a great example of how it should be where at one time somebody's somebody's enemy and they become our friends and they become our allies. And if you look at Grozny, which was leveled, was it seven, eight years ago? Yeah. And you look at it now, it is thriving, flourishing, clean, wonderful, Islamic city where there seems to be complete peace and order. That's a good example. And it's an example that everyone should look at rather than what did he do 10, 15 years ago. You mentioned Syria before. It's interesting to compare these two regions because uh, Syria is the country that is being leveled now and uh, the leadership of Syria is being very harshly criticized by the American leadership. Do you think it is possible to mend those ties and look at the situation with, uh, through your lenses? I, I think it's absolutely possible to, to mend any fence, number one. Number two, I'm not prepared to make a comment on what's happening in Syria because in America, I don't believe we are being told the whole truth. And I don't know if anybody is. I don't know even, even what the Russian people are being told. I, I feel completely confused by the information that I'm getting. I mean, one minute it seems as though uh, 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 you have terrorists and the same terrorists, and I'm calling them terrorists on purpose, the same terrorists were in Libya, then, then, then you know, those same guys were then in Cairo, and then those same guys are now uh, in, in, in Syria calling themselves Syrian. It's a little bit mysterious to me. Now, you, you seem to have a very uh, cosmopolitan and open-minded, at least, view of the world, and maybe that's due to your experience, due to your uh, current engagements, but... Um, while you seem to be accepting and tolerant of cultural differences, does it ever come into conflict with your sense of justice and morality? Because it's very much in the American ethos to spread the American values around the world, and you don't seem to be doing that very explicitly. I don't believe in that at all. I don't believe in you know, spreading American ethos anywhere. I think that all people should believe in their own religious beliefs, their own culture, their own traditions, and they have a right to believe in that. And, and I don't try to impose any of my own feelings or views on anybody for anything. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to take a short break now, but when we come back, he often played law enforcement officers on the big screen, but what made Steven Seagal give 20 years to police service in real life? That's coming up in a few moments on Worlds Apart. Welcome back to Worlds Apart, where we are discussing life and movies with Steven Seagal. Mr. Seagal, you know, just the other day I was interviewing another Steve, Steve Bosniak, a co-founder of Apple, and he's somebody uh, who became uh, a multimillionaire very quickly, but even after that, he secretly taught 
uh, computer science to fifth graders for almost six years. And I think um, you have similar life stories because you worked as a police officer on the bit in Louisiana. I wonder what made you do that? I went to police academy in Los Angeles in about 1982 because I wanted to learn the basics of police law. I was interested in becoming a police officer on a reserve level, which meant that I could go and be a policeman whenever I wanted to be, and then when I wanted to go special, do special security operations or uh, a movie or a musical tour or whatever it was, I could do it. So, of course, back then I wasn't doing movies, but I wanted to be able to do other things. So the main reason I wanted to do this was because I saw in life bad guys who thought they were so big and so bad and so tough that they could murder and rape and rob and pillage and get away with it. And I wanted to say, wait a minute, there's other guys out there that are just as tough or tougher than you and just as ugly or uglier than you. And I wanted to become a police officer so I could help those people who were being victimized, so I could stop people from being murdered, raped, tortured, abused, robbed, and, and that's why I became a police officer. But you continued doing that even after you became famous. And uh, I think most people around the world, they want to do good things in life. But with age, with money, and especially with fame, people tend to, be, to become a bit more arrogant, maybe a bit more cynical, a bit less motivated. What helped you escape that? I mean, I would like to believe that I'm becoming more humble as life goes on and more giving and giving more of my life and my time to the people, you know. You have this very peacemaking, almost pacifist uh, aura around you. You're a Buddhist. And yet, um, both in your acting career and uh, I guess in your work as a police officer, you had to do to deal with lots of guns. And you, you do seem to have a liking of uh, sophisticated weaponry. You are here in Russia to uh, promote a sniper rifle that will bear, as far as I understand, your own name. What attracts you in guns? Is it engineering? Is it the sense of power, something else maybe? I mean, I believe in um, you know the sport, the Olympics, the, uh, shooting and Olympics, long range shooting, uh, all these things. But I also believe that every country has the right to defend their own country. Every man has the right to defend his own wife and children and home. And I also believe that right should triumph over evil. And so I don't have anything against guns because guns in and of themselves don't kill people. People kill people. So a gun is just like a plant or a, a tool, you know, and you can, you can either do good with it, which is to protect and nurture humanity and mankind or destroy. And I'm here to nurture and protect people. Now, I think your own country, the United States, has a very complicated relationship with guns because on one hand, it's almost perceived as a symbol of freedom protected by the Second Amendment. But on the other hand, it also created a specifically American form of violence, mass violence, mass shootings in schools and universities. So I wonder, where do you stand on the issue of gun control in the United States? Well, first of all, I believe in, in the Second Amendment and the Constitution more than anything in the world. And I think that Adolf Hitler, for example, when he wanted to annihilate the people of Germany, the first thing he did was take away their guns. And the, 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 the rights to bear arms wasn't just to protect the people from foreign invaders, it was to protect them against evil governments and anyone that would violate their inherent rights as a human being. So I believe in the Second Amendment and I believe that, I hate to say this, a lot of these mass murders and all this funny stuff that's going on, I believe a lot of this is engineered. And yet in the aftermath of the, I think it was Newtown shooting, you were engaged in a Connecticut program, I think, to teach uh, children in self-defense. Do you think those skills would be helpful if they were faced with somebody who was armed to the Well, first of all, I wasn't teaching children to defend themselves. I was teaching what's called the posse, which are sworn officers to come in and defend schools. And so these are people that have had training with firearms. They have had police training. They're just not on my level, but they are, you know, sworn but you still thought that that, uh, that engagement was important and there, that there's something has to be done about the gun situation within schools and the universities. The most precious gift we have from God is our children. Why can't we spend money and time 
to protect our schools and our children. They have armed guards at every bank, at every jewelry store. If you go around Champs-Élysées, you go around France and Monaco and Beverly Hills, there's all these armed guards everywhere protecting money and jewelry. Why can't we protect our children? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I have to ask you this. Uh, do you think Hollywood and in particular, action movies are partially responsible for glorification of I don't, uh, gun violence. I don't. No? I think that you know the, the the more important thing we need to look at here is mental health, because there are mentally insane people in every country, and God knows we have our share in America, and. I think this is the most important thing to learn there. Look at, I think statistically it's sort of proven that, you know, in Japan, for example, where they have the most violent movies on earth, and they have almost zero crime. What does that tell you? It's not really the movies as much as it's mental health issues and how these people can get help. And it's also parenting. You know, if you have parents who love the children, spend time with their children, teach their children right from wrong, and they have real parenting, you won't see any of this. And yet, if we look at the um, pure data, statistics of violence in the United States, and the access that kids have to uh, guns, the uh, amount of time they spend with their parents, it, it doesn't look pretty well. To be honest with you, my opinion is that the economy is so bad in America, and the common people are spending every waking moment just trying to survive to the point where many of them feel like they, they really don't even have the luxury to spend time with their children. It's about survival now. Now, uh, we talked about guns, um, but there is one weapon that you seem to dislike very strongly, and uh, as far as I understand, this is nuclear weapons. I, I don't know if that's accurate, but it's been reported that you are the, the world's first private citizen to personally sponsored the destruction of a nuclear weapon. Well, Is I don't that know true? if that's true or not, but I do have a great aversion to nuclear weapons, and I would love it if all nuclear weapons were abolished. But it was uh, reported that you donated $100,000 of your own money to dismantle some Russian missiles. Is that accurate? Or Probably. Why, why were you moved to do that? Uh, because I was told that they wanted to dispose of them if they had the money to, and so I'm not sure exactly where what country it was, it might have been Russia, but I was just helping dispose of them at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, given your very active social role and your experience as now international mediator, uh, I wonder if you have ever thought about running for office. I mean, we have the experience of Arnold Schwarzenegger becoming the governor of California, and then there was uh, Ronald Reagan, you mentioned him before. Have you thought about that at all? Because you certainly have the experience now. I mean, really, to be honest with you, whatever I can do to help the world be a better place to help mankind in any way I can. I would be very, very interested in devoting my love and life and time and any kind of knowledge or wisdom I may have. But not the, in the political office. I mean, you know, uh, if I thought that I could really help people, I, I would consider it, although in general, in politics are not something that I think are uh, the best you know, kind of avenue for me to get things done. But your views seem to be on the Republican side, right? I mean, yes, yes. You're obviously a Hollywood star, but uh, in some of your interviews you were quite critical of the Hollywood culture and you sought to distance yourself uh, from Hollywood, from California in real life. Um, why is that? I mean, I don't want to say anything that is critical or bad mouth my quote-unquote colleagues, even though I don't really look at them as colleagues, uh, there are two kinds of actors. There are the kind of actors that are real thespians that come into Hollywood because they are artists and they love acting and they consider it an art and a science and they work at it. That's three out of three million. And, and then a lot of the people who come to Hollywood come to Hollywood because they need to be adored. And the people who need to be adored, it's a kind of a sickness. And, and I call Hollywood the cannibal house because most of those people will eat each other to get ahead. They will do anything to get ahead and they don't realize that one minute they'll, if they're lucky, the, you know, one in a million or one in 10 million, they'll be on top of the world and the next minute, no matter who they are, they're gonna fall down because that's the essence of delusion. That's the essence of Hollywood. So 
I love movies. I love movie making. I think it can be one of the most enlightening, you know, milieus for humans to use to help the world be a better place, to disseminate spectacular emotions and love and information. Of course, movies can be used for, you know, the opposite of that. So it's a spectacular milieu in, in an amazing place. And there are many great, great people in Hollywood, not just actors, directors, producers, but there's also, you know, the allure of those folks that came there for the wrong reasons and uh, stay there for the wrong reasons. Steven Segal, thank you very much for your time. And if you like the show, please join us again. Same place, same time here on Worlds Apart. <laughs>